So good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to this new seminar at the Instituto de Astrofísica de Lucía. Today, we will have the talk by Dr. Laura Hermoso Muñoz, that she's working at the Centro de Astrobiología in Madrid, in Spain. And uh, she will talk about outflows in AGNs from low to high luminosities, the, the case of NGC 7172. Dr. Laura Hermosa, she's uh, one year old, doctor, so <laughs> congratulations. Did her degree at the University of Oviedo here in Spain and her master at the University of La Laguna in Tenerife, where she centered her investigation in dwarf galaxies in the local group. She did her PhD here at the Instituto de Astrofísica de Andalusia, working in the AGN groups and in searching for outflows in low luminosity AGNs. Now she's working at, as a postdoc at the Centro de Astrobiología in, in Madrid, analyzing AGNs with the James Webb uh, Space Telescope data. She's part of the European Consortium of uh, MIRI Guaranteed Time Observations and the GATOS collaboration. So thank you very much, Laura, for being here. And uh, the floor is yours. OK, so thank you, Laura. Thank you, everyone, for being here. So for those of you that already are familiar with my work, the first part of the talk is going to be again the same thing. <laughs> but um, I'm going to center this presentation in two main parts. So the first part is the work that uh, I've been doing here at the IEA during my thesis. And then I'm going to jump on to the work that I'm doing with the JWST data, which I guess that is the part in which you all are more interested in. Um, so let me start just a very small introduction about the AEMs because I guess that you are familiar with them uh, already. So basically, active galactic nuclei are very special uh, regions in the center of galaxies that uh, are very compact and uh, impact heavily the, the evolution of the galaxy. So they are known because they emit a large amount of energy in many different uh, spectral bands. And uh, there are many different types that are more or less summarized in, in that picture, uh, depending on the level of accretion that the uh, black hole, the supermassive black hole is having, and also the field of the point of view uh, with respect to with, um, with which we see the, the, the object. One of the most important things related to AGNs nowadays are outflows and feedback, not, not only AGNs, but galaxies in general. Basically, because uh, outflows are known to impact or are think are thought to be to impact the evolution of galaxies in many many aspects, um, and so there are many things that one can do studying this kind of, of outflows that are essentially uh, gas that is emerging from the central parts of the galaxy. So we can study them through the kinematics of the gas, the energetics, how they impact the stellar formation. Um, the relation that the outflows have with the host and, and so on. And one of the first questions that uh, people wanted to address related to outflows in galaxies is if uh, they are common in galaxies and in particular in, in AGNs. And so very recent work that it, it has been done with, with respect to, to this basically has tried to um, study outflows taking into account their multi-wavelength nature, meaning that for having a complete view of uh, outflows in AEMs and in galaxies in general, one has to take into account all the different phases of the gas, molecular, ionized, neutral gas, or um, X-rays or, or other uh, uh, components. And we end up with this kind of relations in which one uh, can see that we are relating the properties of the outflow, in this case, the mass outflow rate, with respect to the properties of the of the AGN, in this case, is volumetric luminosity. And uh, some relations start to appear, like this one, in which depending on the gas uh, tracer that you are using, we found different uh, relations, but all of them agreed uh, at some point that the larger the volumetric luminosity, the stronger the outflow. So there seems to be a relation in there uh, so that the in the low luminosity end of the uh, AGM family, the outflows are expected to be uh, fainter. 
But uh, this relation has been changing uh, lately. So if we focus, for example, in other work, we see that the initial trend that uh, was mentioned in, in Fiori's plot, now uh, seems, it seems that the new data is uh, slightly offset from the initial relation. And it's not just one work, there are several works that are seeing uh, much more dispersion in this kind of, of plots. But in any in all of these works, the, the, the thing is that we don't know what happens at low luminosity because none of them are tracing volumetric luminosities smaller than 10 to the 43 uh, Earths. So that's uh, where we were focused on in this part. So how does this relation change if we include this low luminosity M? And the reason why it's not uh, populated is that as I told you, in this region, the outflows are expected to be smaller, so then, um, and less powerful, sorry. So then their study should be a bit more complicated, and uh, people were focused just on uh, obtaining the global properties of outflows in more luminous AGLs. So if we focus on liners, which are the majority of the population of AGLs in the low luminosity at the end of the family, uh, we don't know if outflows indeed exist in these, uh, in these systems. So here you have an example of a, of a liner with each, which is NEC4438, which already with these really nice images from the HST, we are seeing a bubble emerging from the center. So apart from this, there are some other individual the discoveries of uh, outflows in, in liners, but there is no uh, systematic search until uh, the work that we uh, did here. And one of the main motivations of studying liners is because these are the most numerous AGM population in the local universe. And uh, this allows us to do spatial result studies of these uh, objects, despite the uh, outflows expected to be uh, smaller. So we started, uh, what the, one of the things that we did was uh, to do a systematic search for the first time of outflows in liners. And for that, we gathered a sample of 17 nearby uh, liners which is the largest uh, atlas up to date of uh, looking for um, ionized gas morphologies in these uh, objects. And so we did a systematic search using uh, optical imaging with uh, proprietary data from the NOT telescope and also HST data from the archive, uh, all very nearby objects. And what we did was essentially to see uh, how the uh, ionized gas was distributed on these galaxies. So we end up finding four different categories for the ionized gas. So that are shown here. The first one would be for halo. Essentially, the gas is concentrated around the, the center of the, of the galaxy. Then we have uh, this halo that is uh, the gas that is uh, oriented along the galactic disk or along the spiral arms or nuclear rings. Then we have the bubble-like, which are the ones we are interested in, basically referring to gas uh, that is in a bubble-like shape or biconical shape or essentially filamentary, not re related to any other special structure of the galaxy. And then we have dusty, which is whenever we've had a dust plane like, covering the, the nuclear part. So using the middle of the percentages in which we detected each uh, category and the one uh, that we detected the, the most galaxies is the bubble light. Although, of course, imaging alone is not sufficient to actually claim that we are detecting outflows, we're just detecting uh, gas that is uh, behaving otherwise, uh, not less as the galaxy itself. So that's why we complemented this with uh, kinematical information from the literature. And for all the 70 objects we detected, uh, well, we, we found uh, kinematical information from 60 of them. Half of them were coming from interval field spectroscopic data, which is nice because uh, interval field spectroscopic data allows us to uh, actually um, characterize better the behavior of the gas in these systems. And from those 60, we found that half of them uh, had a reported detection of an outflow or an inflow which this is setting for the first time a percentage of detection of outflows in liners that was missing until now. So we we have now uh, many uh, a great amount of candidates for hosting an outflow, and uh, now we have to characterize them. So that's the second part um, 
of the talk, that is the analysis that we have done in a small subsample of, of these liners to actually try to see if we were indeed detecting an outflow and uh, we characterize them. So for that, we use Megara. Megara is an integral field uh, unit that is uh, located at the UTC telescope. And um, it, the, the great advantage of Megara is the high sp spectral resolution that it has, going from 6,000 to uh, 20, uh, sorry, 6,000 to 20,000. Uh, and uh, these are the main characteristics of the sample. These are just optical images of the nine galaxies that we selected. And so we started, uh, so, well, first, for giving you an overview of what uh, the analysis was like, first, one of the most important things to characterize the ionized gas is that we have to model the continuum, basically because these liners, as I've mentioned before, are really low luminous objects, which means that they are heavily impacted by the emission of the galaxy. So we really need to get rid of the continuum to actually obtain the true uh, emission from the ionized gas. So here you have an example of the modeling in several uh, bands of uh, Megara that go basically covering from H beta and oxygen three to H alpha and um, sulfur two and so on. Um, that we use the PPXF uh, code for the, the modeling. And then we did the emission line modeling. Here you have uh, an example for one of the galaxies. Uh, we model the emission lines using Gaussian components, allowing up to four different Gaussian components if needed, one going for the broadline region if present, and basically we order them in, to ensure continuity in all the, the maps. So we started this uh, project with NGC 1052, uh, which is a prototypical liner, it's a work that is already published, and then we continued with the whole sample. And I have to say here that three of the galaxies are coming from the Megara survey, which is a survey for exploiting the, the guaranteed time of Megara. Um, and so, and this is a work that is already under preferred uh, revision. So let me start with NGC 1052. So as I mentioned, this is a prototypical liner really close by a galaxy. And it's uh, live, the AGN is living in an early type galaxy where it's known to have a radio jet. And uh, in the images, I'm plotting the field of view of the data that we have. So in red is the field of view of the Megara data. And we also had uh, MUSE data for this galaxy, for which we did a mosaic that was basically covering all the emission from the, from the galaxy. These are the main results of the analysis. So in these maps, we have velocity velocity dispersion and flux. You can see that basically we are mapping the ionized gas in the whole uh, in the whole uh, field of view of the galaxy. These maps correspond to the oxygen tree line. And what we can see is essentially that the gas is uh, rotating. But if we focus on the inner regions and we look to the velocity dispersion, we are seeing some peculiar structure that uh, wasn't expected at first for a regularly rotating system and that has this strange butterfly-like uh, shape. The curious thing is that we, we detected more than one component, as I've told you before. And if we plot the first component with respect to the second one, what we see is that they are more or less perpendicular and the velocities are quite different, also the velocity is person. And in fact, we found that this secondary component has more strength in a kinematics and it's oriented along the direction of the radio jet. So what we have done here is to interpret all of this picture as uh, an outflow that is expanding as a consequence of the presence of the jet. And uh, due to this expansion, it's creating a low, a cocoon of low density uh, gas, which is this uh, butterfly-like uh, uh, gas. And uh, if we are able to, we were able to derive the properties of the outflow, and we are seeing that the outflow is indeed really weak in comparison to the ones that we uh, detected uh, in more luminous agents. And also, it is consistent with being uh, jet driven given their energetics that we derive. So, okay, we are now seeing an outflow for the prototypical liner. What is going on? What happens with the rest of the galaxies? Well, we detected outflow for six out of the nine objects, and 
Each of them has its peculiarities, as I cannot go through all of them. And uh, I have picked two examples to show you what uh, the data looks like. And the first one is when you see 3226, that is uh, this galaxy over here, that is interaction. And what we see is that the primary component of, of the gas is basically gas that seems to be rotating along the, the disk. However, we are detecting a secondary component that is basically concentrated in the in the PSF. And all the maps have the same, uh, are in the same scale. So you see that the kinematics of the secondary component are quite different from the from the primary components. And if we look a bit closer to, to the velocity dispersion map, we are also seeing this butterfly-like shape that we were hinting with NGC 1052. Uh, there is this enhanced sigma region oriented uh, perpendicular to the direction of the disk, uh, which is co-spatial with the presence of the secondary component. Mm -hmm. That is clearly broader than the, than the primary component and also is completely blue shifted. So we interpreted this uh, component as a weak and compact uh, outflow that in this case, uh, there is no uh, radio jet, so it's more likely a AGM driven outflow. And this is the um, situation that we have for many of our targets. So some uh, unresolved uh, emission in the center, but uh, we have other objects as is the case of NGC 4438, in which uh, the emission is uh, more resolved. So I've already shown you this uh, image before. And you see in the in the right part of the image, a close-up uh, view of the inner regions. So it's an H alpha image of the, of the galaxy. And you see that uh, we can uh, trace the, the outflow very nicely with the H alpha emission. So this is what the Megara maps uh, looks like. So we detected three different kinematical components. The first one, so as the case for NEC 3226, seems to be like gas rotating along the direction of the disk, which is marked by the, that uh, uh, black line. But then the secondary and third component have really different kinematics from the from the disk component. So what we have uh, interpreted here is that the secondary component looks exactly like the uh, bubble of gas that was already traced with H alpha. And we see, for example, that the, uh, the, the velocity dispersion is enhanced in the borders of the bubble. So this could be related to uh, shocks as the uh, bubble expands through the medium. And of course, the flux is uh, just <laughs> the bubble. And then the third component that again has very different kinematics from the from the other two, we have uh, interpreted it as uh, related to uh, radio emission that is seen in 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 that direction. Okay, so now in general, how do these uh, outflows compare with other um, AGNs, and how do they fit in the relation of theory that? Um, I've shown uh, before. So this is what we have found. So this is the same relation as in interaction. We have the volumetric luminosity versus the mass outflow rate. So the crosses are the Fiore's uh, plot, and this uh, line would be the initial relation by Fiore. And these colored points are our liners. So what we essentially are seeing is that we are completely out of the relation. We are above. Uh, the values that uh, were expected for this uh, kind of uh, outflows. So this is telling us that the, these outflows that we're detecting in liners are stronger than were initially thought for these uh, AGNs. But also, in any case, we are finding uh, very compact outflows with uh, parsec scales outflows, I mean, and uh, deriving their energetics uh, we are seeing that these outflows definitely are not able to uh, quench the host galaxy. So these are not expected to have a huge impact on the uh, evolution of the gas content of the, of the system. So now what we are seeing in this new picture is that, is that if we go to low luminosity, and in fact, if we take a luminosity range from 10 to, 10 to the 41 to 10 to the 45 approximately, or we have a really high dispersion on the measurements of the mass outflow rate. 
And we are not the only ones that uh, are working on this. And in fact, this uh, really high dispersion on the mass of flow rate is the motivation of the work that uh, I'm doing now. And now I'm gonna jump to the third part of the talk, which is the analysis with the JWST data. So with the GATOS project, that is a project that is focused on analyzing uh, activity in galaxies through many different uh, data sets and many different aspects. So searching for Taurus, Autos, and so on. Uh, we have this um, JWST program that aims to uh, understand why we found this really large dispersion on the first uh, relation. So this project has selected six galaxies. All of them are ciphers that have very similar volumetric luminosity, but have a difference of three orders of magnitude on the uh, mass of flow rate. So the aim here is to try to understand what is the physics behind uh, that could be driving that these outflows are actually so uh, different. And so for that, we have selected JWST data. Just to give you an overall impression in case that uh, you are not familiar with the JWST data yet. So we have, so all this data is based on MIDI, uh, uh, the MIDI instrument. MIDI is the MIDI infrared instrument of the JWST. It has several observing modes, so imaging, coronography, and spectroscopy like two. Uh, in this case, we are focused on the MRS mode, which MRS means medium resolution spectroscopy. Basically, it's uh, an eye view. So again, there are cubes as for mu and megara. And uh, it has four different eye views that are divided in what we call four different channels. So each of them has slightly different properties of field of view, spatial, and spectral resolution. This is just an overview impression of the eye views that work based in R2 mu's. And at the end, what you have is uh, 12 different data cubes that are covering a total wavelength range from five to 28 microns approximately. So each of the cubes has slightly uh, different efficiencies and slightly different properties. Mm -hmm. uh, the smaller field of view that we have is approximately a square of uh, four times four arc seconds and the largest is seven times eight arc seconds more or less. Okay, so uh, from all the six galaxies, I'm focused on one of them, which is NGC 7172, this is a type 2 uh, seaford, a really beautiful uh, almost edge on uh, galaxy. Uh, also, again, very close by, and, and the luminosity the same as all the others. And for this, this galaxy has been already studied in, in through many different uh, um, um, data. So it has been analyzed with Muse already, also with Symphony, with Alma. And uh, it's known to host a nuclear ring, which is almost a on again as a galaxy. And one of the most important things of this galaxy and the thing that we are more interested about is that there is a detection of an outflow in several phases. So with MUSE, it was detected a, an ionization cone that was going from north to the south part of the galaxy. And later on, it was corroborated the presence of an outflow also using symphony data, mainly with the ionized uh, gas. And in this case, you see that, is, that it was more detected towards the, so, the south part of the, of the galaxy. And also, it was some tentative detection of a molecular gas outflow, again, in the southern part uh, direction of the galaxy. So this is what the integrated spectra of one of the channels uh, looks like for, for this galaxy. So you can see that we have, well, I have divided the three different bands just to give you an overview of the complexity of the, of the spectra. And you can see that we're finding many different emission lines. So there are many things and many studies that what one can do with this kind of, of, of data. One of the things that uh, we can be focused on is the molecular gas, because we have detected many, many emission uh, lines corresponding to the warm molecular gas. In this case, with that, we can study the excitation, we can uh, derive, of course, the properties of outflows, if, if any, and uh, also properties such as uh, the um, column density of the gas and, and so on. Other thing that one can do with this kind of data is focus on the ionized uh, gas. 
which is uh, basically the, the thing that I'm doing right now. And to this, we have low MCs in gas and high MCs in gas, and each of them is telling us something uh, different. With this, of course, we can derive line ratios, uh, talk about metallicities, excitation, and uh, and for this galaxy, we are not seeing them, but for some others, we also have these uh, PHS features that can be really strong for some of the uh, JWST uh, galaxies. And with that, we can trace we can trace basically how the, the dust behaves in these systems. To give you again an overview of how complicated the data can be uh, initially, here you have two screenshots that have been done with COVID view of two different parts on two different cubes of the galaxies. And here you have neon five uh, line and oxygen four line. We are immediately seeing that there are two peaks. So actually we are seeing a very complex profiles that need to be modeled uh, really carefully. So for that, uh, we have started using Alucine, which is a code that based, that was was published in in this paper by Luis Peralta in 2023. That uh, basically what it does is model the spectra with Gaussians, so it, it can do fitting for MUS, Megara, and also JWST uh, data. And uh, it's very uh, powerful tool, and also it's very quick. And we have complemented it with a self-developed code also to, to do the modeling and compare, and with a non-parametric analysis of the mission line, because in this case, the two components are quite uh, separated one from the other. So to give you an overview of uh, what we are getting, this is all pretty my pretty my work. You have the maps velocity, velocity dispersion, and flux. For two uh, emission lines, the first uh, row corresponds to H2S19, so one molecular gas, and the second row corresponds to neon 6, which is one of the highest um, ionization emission lines that we are uh, seeing. And you can see that already the picture is quite different depending on what uh, line you are uh, seeing. So this is just a model with Gawa, one Gaussian for red light, okay? So in the top part, we see that the molecular gas is really nicely traced in the disk. That is, uh, we see it in the flux. We see a slightly high enhanced dispersion uh, again along the, the disk and this really nice uh, velocity rotation uh, map. So in, in the velocity dispersion, we found some like blobs corresponding to uh, uh, H2 regions because I've meant, as I have mentioned, uh, there is a nuclear ring uh, right there. But if we focused on the high ionization emission lines, we see a completely, di a completely different picture. In this case, we are not tracing the disk, but we are tracing this egg-shaped uh, uh, gas that is more likely the ionization cone that was already uh, seen. So, but in this case, the big difference is that we are also detecting this uh, ionization cone in the northern part that was not detected neither with the optical or with uh, symphony or with um, of course. If we do an analysis of uh, two different components, now the the we can actually see the outflow. So here you have the the maps for the oxygen four. So now the maps are a bit changed. Here is the flux, velocity, and velocity dispersion, first and secondary component. And what you can see is that the, the first component seem could be related to the disk, also could be related to the alpha already. And then the secondary component that is more prominent to the south, uh, that is probably related to the alpha that was already uh, detected with, uh, with MUSE. On the right part, I'm putting some integrated uh, profiles of the emission lines. So again, uh, we see very, very, very broad uh, profiles and two components that are easily seen. So with that, we can do the parametric analysis that basically relies on detecting where is the peak of the emission and where uh, do we find the largest velocities of the, of the line. So in this case, we can derive these parameters that are uh, B10, B50, 90, and 98, but tell us more about how the outflow behaves and what is the speed and so on. And we are finding similar values to what were found in the paper by Davis et al. that was with optical data. 
for the outflows velocity. So this is telling us that indeed the, this emission is probably the outflow that we were looking for. And so with that, I just come to my summary that I did in a different way, just in case I have bored you and there are no questions. That is, uh, I'm doing some questions for you instead of uh, you for me. So what we are seeing is that indeed outflows are common in liners, and we see that the majority of them are compact, and they seem to be stronger than they were uh, initially seen. So are they actually weaker than are the models that we think about outflows in liners right, or is it just a matter that they were not detected before? Also, we have this really large scattering the mass outflow rate um, uh, plot versus volumetric luminosity. We don't know what is the origin yet of this. How can the maybe infrared information help here? Can we uh, find something that we have not seen before? Or is it just that the assumptions that we are having for estimating these parameters maybe are not completely correct? So we have to come back. So we have to take a step back and see what are the differences uh, on velocities, maybe on the estimations of densities, and so on. And with that information, maybe you can redo this plot and have some more significant comparison. And that's all that I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura, for these wonderful results. So, questions? Oh, is that? <laughs> And it's just like, one of the plots you, you're showing for James Double Web, James and the Marine was this tea, and that one. Then some white points in the uh, mm -hmm. the, the gas. Mm -hmm. uh, why is it that? So they, we have uh, some problems there when the engine is really strong in the center because some of the lines are heavily impacted by the continuum. And sometimes, uh, especially with the molecular gas, we cannot uh, fit the lines in a spark cell by spark cell basis. So for the central parts, the, the trend now is to work with integrated spectra, basically, because if the gene is really strong, we cannot uh, see the lines as clearly as for the objects. And this is ha happening in the molecular gas. So, for example, with the uh, neon 6, we don't have that problem. And yeah, thank you. Um, yes, could you uh, please go back to where you saw us the plots of neon 5? I don't see four nines. That neon 5 is the one at 24 microns or at 14 microns? 24. 24. Mm -hmm. And you saw us the simplified. And can you compare that one to the neon 5, 14 microns? Yes, and I have the light ratio, but I cannot show you yet. <laughs> <laughs> In any case, if you if you the light ratios also with other neon 5 species, it's really nice because we are actually seeing the ionization code uh, really, really nice. Mm. That's okay. <laughs> Questions? Okay. Yeah, um, you you pose the questions to us, but I we send them to you. So what what would you ask to your own questions at the end? <laughs> no, so 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 I guess that uh, I'm not sure if this relation makes sense anymore, because for you obtaining these mass outflow rate um, values, you need to assume uh, density. You need to assume um, Velocity, well, assume or estimate velocity, uh, also the radius of the of the outflow, so and for all of that, you need to make some assumptions that not everybody does the same assumptions, no, and all of these uh, parameters impact really, really much the, this distribution. So I guess that one of the things that needs to be done is actually going back to analyzing all the parameters individually, so not plotting volumetric luminosity against mass outflow rate, but maybe against velocity, against radius, see how that parameter changes, and then see how they can propagate into this 
because if not, we are just mixing things that maybe doesn't make sense. No? So in this case, for example, well, you know that for aligners, we are finding density, so more than 100, 1,000 as much. But for example, the, the triangles from Baron et al. assume densities of 20,000. So a difference on two orders of magnitude then implies also huge difference on the mass of the rate. So maybe we should come back to analyzing individual characteristics and prior to, to deriving these properties. That's my guess. No questions. Laura? Eva. Uh, Laura, coming back to the that you saw the, the previous the line previous, uh, where is the narrow in this direction? <laughs> I mean, one is that these lines trace by all the narrow in region. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So are you allowed to separate the narrow in region from the soft region? Well, what, what, this is an issue. I mean, where does the outflow start and the decision cone? Where is the narrow in region? In that sense, I think that we need to analyze all the lines at once. I mean, because probably are going to analyze these lines that are low ionization emission lines can trace better the, the behavior of the narrow line region. But this is work in progress. I mean, it's not only the, the feeds that we do with Gaussian, but also I guess that the non-parametric analysis is going to help because in this case, the outflow component is really quite well uh, defined. So yeah. <laughs> But of course, we have to take it carefully, the analysis. Yeah. Okay. The problem here is that you are assuming at least independent because you have a determination of the okay? Mm -hmm. or the okay? Mm -hmm. And the flow is using this flow. But you need to determine what is the radius. Mm -hmm. Where is your cubic that is divided by it? Mm -hmm. Then depending the definition is supposing a constant radius, probably. Okay, and it's still true when you go to the inner part of the outflows in the perineal uh, part of the broad line region with reverberation, you can have an idea of the radius. Mm -hmm. Okay, but with other lines, really you need to suppose a relation. Or a constant radius for all the objects, mm -hmm. and how you determine your radius in your objects? Well, in our case, basically they are all, all most most of them are unresolved. So in that case, we assume it's the PSF size because we cannot resolve in the inner parts. For those that are resolved, we measure it directly, but we have not projected them, which is also a problem because we are lacking outflow models that tells us how the outflow is propagating in the galaxies. And so if we cannot deproject them, then of course every values that you are going to measure is wrong because there is some extra component that, that you are not taking into account. <laughs> but yeah, in any case, uh, for our liners that are compact, we are assuming that is the size of the plasma. We cannot do anything. That is the question of paper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I know. So that's why I, I said that we need to take a step back because I mean, if we cannot determine the radius well, then how are you going to determine the, the it's going to be wrong already. And you start to sum up all the uh, uncertainties and then you end up with something that's probably not something to be compared with. No questions. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, the elephant in the room, the radio jet. I mean, uh, is uh, uh, for 71, 72, uh, is there a radio jet? No. no. And in your sample of the genes, well, are you, uh, is covering also the radio emission so you can uh, compare radio jet uh, out the wave in host galaxy with radio jet? And no, I don't think that's uh, that was the initial objective of just focusing on the radio. 
So the thing is that what they wanted to, to do is to select galaxies that had more or less the same AGN host so that the differences in the outflows should come from other things. Uh, but the radio was not uh, the one of the things that was taken into account. But I cannot tell you how many that have the radio because I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Pardon? Last one. Um, promise. Um, for the optical analysis of low luminosity agents and for the big issue to subtract its uh, contribution. Um, what do you think for the uh, case of the James Webb telescope? For Thanks. some objects, it's an issue. For some others, it's not relevant in the sense that mm, what we are doing now is to analyze the emission lines, and they are so strong. And I mean, it's a huge difference between analysis of the liners and the GWST. So many of the cases are actually not necessary for doing what you want to do. That is basically analyzing the kinematics. But there are other galaxies that have really strong continuum, and in those, you have to take it more carefully, the, the analysis definitely, because if not, you're are probably going to have problems. But in, in this case, it's enough for what we have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, I think we can close the talk here. We thanks again, Laura.